Hi, and welcome back. I'm Jean Farish, and I'm so glad that you're here with me for our floss tube chat of the week. Have a lot of things to um, talk to you about. We're going to talk about some framing choices. Um, I'm going to show you how to do a herringbone stitch. We're going to talk about um, sampler hashtag September sampler. And we're going to um, answer a lot of questions that were left as comments. I have a couple things that are sort of leftovers from um, topics that we covered last week and then some new things as well. So sit back and relax and let's take a look. We're going to start with um, some framing ideas. I mentioned last week that I forgot to take my phone with me when I went to the frame shop. So I went back and um, we pulled a, a, about a half a dozen different um, frame choices so I can show you. The first one here is it's actually what I'm going to be using. And um, at first I thought that this was a little too orange, but um, I really like the warmth of this red. And if you'll notice the little sticker that's on there, it was on their half price um, area. So that made it even more attractive. I think I would have picked it out anyway, but um, since it's such a large frame, um, that half price uh, sticker really made it um, kind of a shoe in as far as which one I was gonna choose. And then here's some other ideas. There are lots of different red choices. Um, I thought originally about doing this sort of glossy red that would really give it the look of a, of a, of a poster, which is kind of what I was going for. Um, and then um, my uh, frame lady said, well, let's take a look at what the blue would look like. So we looked at a couple different blues and it's really interesting. There are so many colors in this, in this chart that you can go with almost anything. And then of course, there's also the traditional um, kind of wood look, just the natural look. Um, you can go anywhere from something kind of rustic and primitive to something a little bit more sophisticated. So that was really the, the final thought that, that she left me with. She said, you know, this is a piece that you can frame almost any way. And I, and I happen to agree with her. The original piece, the one that was lost in shipping, um, if I remember correctly, I framed it with a blue mat and uh, a natural wood frame. And I, I liked it like that, but... Um, I am really excited about this piece and I, I can't wait to actually get it back. So that's where we are with that. Um, lots of comments. I'm sure many of them were prompted by um, my giveaway offer and saying that all you had to do was say the, the word America and uh, you would be entered. Um, but there were also a lot of very heartwarming um, comments that I just really made me feel extra good about about this piece. Many people who mentioned that they were service members or that um, family members were in the service. And I, I know that we, we just don't say it often enough. And that is that I just appreciate so much all the military men and women who give of their, their time and their life and make all kinds of sacrifices. Um, that really, unless you live that life, you really don't have any idea um, what it means. But um, I just, you know, it just means so much to me that that uh, people took the time to, to leave comments. One of them I want to share with you came from Nancy, and she said that her dad was a Navy chaplain, and they lived all over America. Um, and so she was thinking about stitching it and personalizing it with the dates that they lived in each state. And I thought, you know, again, that's just a clever, clever way of uh, making changes. Let me also point out here that um, what I what's nice about this design is that you can actually expand each one of the states. And um, because the borders are just straight, it would be very easy to um, make the, the states the squares deeper if you wanted to have more space to like to do something like leave a date. Just keep in mind that when I give you the stitch count at the beginning of this chart, it's for the way it's charted. So if you're going to add uh, a depth to each one of the squares, you're going to have to account for that as well.
but again, just so many different ways that you can make a project like this mean that much more to you and your family. So um, just enjoy. Um, oh, also, um, many people mentioned that they had stitched it for their own classrooms or for the classroom of a daughter or a son who are, are in, in a teaching profession. And it's really making me think about this. Um, and I'm, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with mine yet, but I'm thinking it may end up in a classroom somewhere. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you've got the time to stitch, think about stitching one and donating it to your local public elementary or middle school or, or even a, a high school. And, um, you know, that would just be a really, really neat thing to do. So, um, okay, so next is that when I was at the frame shop um, a couple weeks ago, I actually picked out the frame for Jane Hattersley. This is something I've never done before. Usually I wait till I've got it stitched before I even think about a frame. But when I was trying to, to, to choose the frame for the hair in the basket, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, I came across this one sample and I just thought, this looks like Jane Hattersley. So um, I'm kind of, you know, keeping that in the back of my mind. Not making a commitment yet, but I, it's, I, I think that that's gonna be, I think that's gonna be the one. So um, we have this new hashtag, hashtag September sampler. And I don't really know who started it or where it started or entirely what it means. And I hope I'm not misusing it, but I'm just thinking that September is a great month for stitching samplers. Actually, any month, in my opinion, is a great month for stitching samplers. But um, so I've been using it for um, my post on Instagram about about my my trio of what I call my ampersand samplers, since it's the hare and the basket, the bear and the moose, the deer and the grapes. Okay, so as you can see, I picked a frame that has kind of an inlay, um, and I really like how it sets off the stitching. So um, let me pick up my needle that I like to use as a pointer here. Um, so in the sampler, there really are quite a few especially stitches. Um, this is the cross corner cushion stitch, which is I, I use for the center of the flowers. Um, then there's the fishbone stitch and the herringbone stitch um, in a couple different colors and fishbone stitch again. And then um, down here towards the end, we have a satin stitch and we have um, a satin stitch done as an upright stitch. Um, and then another satin stitch that's done um, in the shape of these hearts. So one of the things I, I do want to um, tell you about not only this sampler, but all three in the series is that in the chart pack, whether you buy it from a shop or whether you get the, the PDF download from my Etsy store, I do include notes of how you can do the whole thing in cross stitch. Um, you don't, you know, I, I personally think it's lovely with the, with the specialty stitches, obviously, since that's the way I designed it. And I really want to encourage you to branch out a little bit and try them. Other than the heart shaped satin stitch and the upright satin stitch, any of these stitches can be done on, on Aida cloth. The two um, satin stitches would be very easy to just substitute um, cross stitch. And like I say, I do give the, the directions in the chart on, on how to do that. So if you're so inclined, if you wanna grab a needle and thread and uh, stitch along with me, I'm gonna show you how to do the um, herringbone stitch. I'm going to stitch with a single strand of flower thread. Um, so that I can um, use the away waste knot um, to kind of refresh your memory uh, about that. And also so that you will know how to do this, whether you're stitching with a single strand like flower thread or one of the silk threads or any, any thread that's heavy enough to do with a single strand. Um, 
if you're doing working with a double strand, you can start with a loop method. The herringbone stitch has so many variations in terms of the height, the width, um, exactly where in the chart you start, um, etc. So what I'm keep in mind that what I'm going to be showing you is a general idea of how to do the herringbone stitch. I'm also showing you how to do it in the hair in the basket. Um, but understand that if you look at a chart or a diagram that's a little bit different, it could be that that the stitch is, is taller or wider or both in, in the design that, that, that you're looking at. Okay, so I have my um, away waist knot a distance away from where I'm going to be stitching, a good three or four inches. And um, I am now going to do a half cross um, going in this direction. So I'm going to come over to and down to. And before I leave that spot, I'm going to slip my needle under two linen threads. Now, if you're working on Aida, you're going to do the same thing, except you're just talking about squares when I'm talking about two threads. So um, from there, I'm now going to count over two, four threads and come up two, four threads, and scoop up two linen threads. Now, from here, I'm going to come ahead one, two, three, four threads, scoop up two. From here, coming ahead two, four threads, whoops, scoop up two. Come ahead two, four, scoop up two. So I'm obviously showing you how to do this as a sewing motion. You can do it as a poke and pull, but I find it's easiest to execute it um, without mistakes by doing it as a sewing motion. This is a stitch that goes very, very quickly. So again, on the bottom, I'm coming ahead, four threads, scooping up two, whoops. Sorry, I was off camera there a little bit. And on the top, I'm coming ahead, two, four threads, and scooping up two. Notice that each time my needle is pointing in the same direction. So if you find your needle in any direction other than on the horizontal like this and pointing toward the left, then you need to stop and think about what you're doing because you're probably doing it wrong. So that is all there is to the herringbone stitch. Now you can see where it looks like a series of cross stitches and that's what makes it very easy to substitute cross stitches um, for the herringbone stitch. For example, I would do a single cross stitch here, a single one here, a single one here, a single one here, and just kind of go back and forth in a zigzag, and you're going to kind of get the same look. Um, but I, I hope that you'll try the herringbone stitch. It's very, very easy. Um, let's take a look at what it looks like on the back. So now remember that this is my this is my tail from my away waist knot. But you can see where all you end up with are like it looks like a little series of back stitches. So if the back of your herringbone stitch looks like this, then you're doing it right. So um, again, just as a review on the away waist knot, let me grab my scissors here. You're gonna cut this um, knot off. Sorry about that. I cut the waist knot off. Um, when I was off camera and I didn't realize I did that. But so I've cut the waist knot off and now this is the tail that I left at the beginning. And now I'm simply going to um, tunnel under the existing stitches. And I, I just go back and forth like this. And this allows um, the thread on the back to lie flat and because um, it's kind of a, a loose um, 
proposition. I'm, 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 I'm doing it several times. So um, that's how you do it. And once I get to the end of this row, I would bury the tail at the end the same way I just did this one. So that is the herringbone stitch. And I, um, I, I, ho I hope that you'll use it. In addition to sharing the way the, the names are formatted, these um, samplers in the series also share some of the same stitches um, in the deer and the grapes. We again have the herringbone stitch and the fishbone stitch. And then I also have um, a little bit of the satin stitch down here towards the end. Let me get this lined up right. Um, and this, oops, in this series of hearts right here where I've cross-stitched the heart shape and then filled it in with a satin stitch. So um, that's um, the deer and the grapes. And then on the bear and the moose, again, we've got the herringbone stitch up here. Um, it's here in a couple different colors, the blue and the green, and then I think one more time in, in the gold. And then we also have the fishbone stitch in this one as well. So again, these directions um, tell you how to convert it into doing it all in cross stitch. Although in the case of the fishbone stitch, um, the best way to replicate that is, is with, um, you can do it with a half cross. It's not gonna look exactly the same, um, but again, if you're not, you know, if you're not ready for specialty stitches, then it, it's a good alternative. So that's that. Oh, we have um, four more shops that are carrying these, these designs. Um, and I will give the information at the end um, of, of the videotape. But we have um, in Florida, we've got Stitcher's Paradise. In Minnesota, we have Stitchville USA. In New Jersey, we have um, Citrus Delight. Not Citrus Delight, I'm sorry. Ah, I ruined that. In New Jersey, we have Needleworkers Delight. And then in Colorado, we have um, a stitching shop. And I, I will mention at this point um, that stitching shop also carries Cosmo Floss, which I've talked about to the point where I am getting some very good questions from people um, about why I love it so much. And so I thought I would just take just a minute to chat about that. I have no, I don't own stock in the company. I don't have any monetary gain whatsoever in whether or not you stitch with it or not. Um, but I just, I just love it so much. I wish it were more readily available. So let me tell you how I first got introduced to Cosmo Floss. So a little bit of a story. Um, I was shopping with one of my sisters. Um, I'm in the middle of five girls, by the way. But I was shopping with one of my sisters who is an excellent quilter. And we were shopping in Northern Virginia at a quilt store. And, um, you know, I, I do a very small amount of quilting. So it didn't take much to twist my arm for me to go with my sister Faye. So we go into this quilt store and um, I'm wandering around and I notice a case of floss. And I thought, why is there floss in a quilt show store? So I started looking at it and oh my gosh, the colors, they were just something about the quality of the color that just grabbed my attention. And then the range, I mean, you'd pick any one of the color colors that they, sell and there was just a wonderful range from very pale to very deep um, in that same color and so I started asking questions and I found out that this floss is made in Japan uh, the company's been around since the 1950s so they're they're not you know they're not you're not they're not brand smacking spanking new now they're the company's not as old as DMC I, I will grant you that but you know that's that's a substantial um, length of time for this company to have been in business they use only the highest quality cotton grown in the world. Um, they, um, the, the qual I don't know, there's something about the quality of it as I'm stitching with it. 
it just seems to just glide. So again, mainly what surprised me was I was coming across a brand I had never seen before and that I was finding it in a quilt store. So in chatting with the owner, what I found out is that there's a very um, popular quilt um, designer who started using it in her crazy quilts, uh, embellishing quilts with, with embroidery, which is, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful use of embroidery. And um, her designs became so popular that quilt stores started carrying the floss. So why don't you find it in crusted shops then? Now, I will preface what I'm going to say by saying this is, this is kind of an editorial. I have not done research. Um, this is just my take on the situation. We are so used to DMC being the standard that we don't look too far beyond that. And when I say we, I'm talking about designers like myself and shop owners and, and consumers. Um, the second thing is that Cosmo Floss is a lot more expensive than DMC. Um, you're gonna find it anywhere from $1.10 to $1.20 a skein maybe even a little bit more, I, I don't know. That's the range I have found it in. So that kind of gives people pause to whether or not they um, want to spend more than, you know, whatever the going rate is for DMC. So what is it? A, 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 about twice as expensive. Um, you're not gonna find it in, in uh, the big box stores. Um, you're gonna find it in high-end quilt stores, and in really, really good crusted shops. I know of two right now that you can get it from in the U.S. As I mentioned before, one of them is a stitching shop in Denver, and the other one is Sassy Jacks in Weaverville, North Carolina. Now, Sassy Jacks is just starting to get it in, so she doesn't have the full line yet. Um, but these are two places that I know you can get it. So what would it take for Cosmo to kind of be, become our standard embroidery floss? And in my opinion, again, that's, that's all this is, it's my opinion is it would take designers calling for it and, and shops carrying it. And I think when and if those two things happen, you the consumer will try it and you're gonna love it. It, it is just, it is, Stitching with bliss. It is. It's. It's just. It's. It just. It's just a wonderful product. So um, the the other thing is, and this is not a small thing. Again, is the is the color range. Let me um, show you. This is. These are the colors that I pulled that are in um, the hair in the basket. Um, you know, this lighting isn't, isn't really good. I might take a photo and, and insert it in the video. So, um, this just kind of gives you an idea of, of, of the range. So when we talk about black in the Cosmo line, we have, here are four different blacks. 600 is probably the closest to what you would think of as being a true black. 601 is such a deep charcoal, it's almost black. 602 is like a blue black. 603 is like a brown black. If you saw any one of these skeins by itself, you would pick it up and say, oh, here's black. But when you start looking at the four of them next to each other, that's when you see the incredible attention to color that this company pays. And that's one of the reasons I love it as a designer. It gives me a palette of color that's beyond anything that I've used before. So if I sound overly enthusiastic, please understand that I love this floss. And for my own stitching, it's all I'm gonna use. So, you know what I've got to do? When I was talking about hashtag September sampler, I've got to show you my progress on, on Jane Hattersley. So let me get this out and um, show you what's going on with her. Um, I have 
just about given up on trying to do both samplers at the same time. And so what I'm working on right now is what I'm calling the contemporary um, version. It's not the strict reproduction sampler um, as far as um, the color of linen or the colors of floss. I have um, brightened them a little bit um, just as an alternative and, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. So let me show you where I am. This is what I've gotten done. And um, I'm just really, really pleased with it. I love this little tool up here. And when you're stitching something like this, um, this is where you want to stitch in columns instead of in rows. And um, yeah, so that's it. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with Jane. Last week when we talked about dampening cloth to prevent knots and tangles, I got lots of comments about that. And the most common question I got was, is it okay to dampen over dyes and silks? And several of you asked one or the other or both of those questions. And here's basically my answer to that. First of all, you don't have to stitch with it while the thread is still damp. If you have any question about the color fastness of the um, thread, then I would advise waiting until it's completely dry before stitching with it. Um, silk, by its very nature, is one of the strongest threads in the world, except when it's wet. When it's wet, it is weakened. So again, if you're stitching with silk, then I would suggest that you wait until um, it has completely dried before you stitch with it. The dampening, the the purpose of the dampening is to straighten the thread out. There's no great advantage to stitching with it while it's still damp, nor do you have to wait until it dries if it's color fast and if it's not silk. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Heather asked me my thoughts on thread conditioner and beeswax on thread. Okay, then I'm, uh, I'm probably going to upset the apple cart a little bit with this. I don't, I don't, I started to say I don't have anything against thread conditioners, but actually I do. Most textile conservationists would say the fewer additives we can put into our needlework, the better. So my question becomes, what is the purpose on cotton floss for counted cross stitch? I'll, I'll, I'll talk in just a moment about other forms of embroidery. But for counted cross stitch, where you're using 100% cotton floss or 100% linen thread, as I do with my pull thread work, then I just question the, the purpose of it. If it's to prevent tangles and knots, we already said, you know, just dampen it with water. And, you know, basically you're straightening out, you're getting the kinks out of the thread. And that is what's preventing the knots. The, the water is not some magical additive that's changing the nature of the thread. It is simply straightening it out so you don't have the places that knots form. Okay, now beeswax is a little bit different because it, it, it is natural. But again, I just asked the question, what is it doing to your needlework? And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, what's the benefit of using it? What is it doing to either improve your stitches or increasing the longevity of your stitches or whatever. What is the benefit of it? All of our actions and all the decisions we make, whether it's about needlework or other things, there's a thing that you need to look at and that's the cost benefit ratio. What is it doing and what is the benefit? And then you make a decision based on that. Now, um, before I leave the subject though, I do wanna say something about beeswax, something more about beeswax. Um, Beeswax, I, I know of two very positive uses of, of beeswax from my own experience. I am sure there are more, but that's all I can speak to is my own personal experience. One of them is when you're sewing on buttons, 
Does anybody even still do that? But, um, you know, all my life I've been a home sewer uh, from, from my early years um, as a teenager and into my young adulthood. I, I rarely bought anything ready-made. I made all of my clothes, including suits and jackets. And when you're sewing a button on a suit or jacket, then running the thread through beeswax is, is a good idea. Um, and my very limited experience with gold work um, is that beeswax has a very definite purpose in stitching um, in, in the embroidery technique of, of gold work. Beyond that, I, 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 just, I just don't know what, what the purpose of it is. And I'm sure I'm going to get mail about this. And I, I welcome your comments and your experience. And if somebody can tell me what the great benefit is of either one of those project, products for your cotton thread on counted thread work, then I am all ears. I, 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 I welcome... I welcome any kind of an honest discourse about the pros and cons of, of any of the things that we do. Um, anyway, so that answers that question, I hope. Okay, so another question I got was about the um, pins that I use in framing. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm not a lacer. I, you won't find me giving you a demonstration on lacing. There's nothing wrong with it. It just isn't. Uh, a technique that I employ. And I try really hard not to, um, um, you're, you're not gonna find me demonstrating or talking about things that I don't personally use. So when I pin my needlework to, to uh, acid-free foam core, what I'm using are sequin pins. Um, they're, they're much, much tinier, about at, at least half the length of, of a typical uh, straight pin. And I use um, the ones that are um, labeled to be nickel plated steel. In my experience, they don't rust. And th that's a big question. So you want a sequin pin in terms of the length. There's no sense in trying to push an inch and a half or two inches into the foam core. The, the length of a sequin pin is fine. Uh, and if you look for the ones that are nickel plated steel, then um, I find them to be perfectly safe. Uh, in fact, at the end of this video, I think I'm going to also give you a link to um, a blog that was written by Threads Magazine, which is, a, which is an excellent resource where they tested different types of pins um, both straight pins and safety pins to test them for um, whether or not they would rust. And I, I found that to be very enlightening. So that's that. Um, okay, one other thing is that um, I've got a couple questions about the thread drops. And one tip I want to share with you, which was not asked as a question. Uh, I want to demonstrate here. When I am not uh, actively using my thread that's on thread drops for a project, um, these are the colors for the contemporary or more modern version of uh, Jane Hattersley. I um, tie mine up in a very, very loose knot. Just I, I just roll it around my fingers like this and tuck the end like in, in like this. And that is going to keep it from getting tangled and um, for getting all frayed. So that's one tip I want to add. Um, let me go ahead and show this to you too. Um, this is the Dretz brand uh, sequin pens that I, that I like to use. Um, and you find them very... Um, very often in any sort of um, sewing notions um, section of a store. So those are two things I wanted to share with you. And, oh, then the other question I did get about thread drops are, is this, and that is, what do you do when you, when you do have um, a little bit of thread left over? And 
I thought I had one on here, but I don't. Ah. So I've got this piece of red, and all I'm going to do is just um, put it on the thread drop, just like I do the, the big bunch, and I just um, put it around. Um, basically, you're, you're making a lark's head um, and just attaching it like that, and then it's it's handy for the next time I need a, a shorter piece. So I, I hope that that helps. Um, that was a really good question. Lois sent in that question. And I, I really, I love the questions that I'm being asked. It, 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 it helps me sort of um, remember what it's like to be a beginner and to, um, and it kind of gives me a, a checklist of things to talk to you about. And it, it really helps me know what's on your mind. So please um, keep sending in these questions. They're, they're great. Okay, so um, I have two other questions that, that came in last week that I wanna, wanna talk about. And one sort of piggybacks with what I was just saying. This one came from Deanna. And she said, I have always started my stitching by putting my needle in the top left corner and crossing over to the lower right and come up through the bottom left and cross over to the top right hole. Is this crazy? I do not remember how I learned this, but it was imprinted in my brain by now. Um, do you think this has any wrongful effect on my work? And my answer to that is absolutely not. The only thing I would say that's critical is that your top stitch lie in the same direction throughout the piece. So, if, if, it's, if your top stitch is slanted like this, they should all be slanted like this. If your top stitch is slanted like this, they should all be slanted like that. And that's the only should I'm gonna put, put on this. I'm guilty of this also, and that is that when I draw a diagram for cross stitch for beginners, I'm saying, okay, go from the bottom left to the upper right, and then, you know, it doesn't matter which corner you're moving from one leg of this cross stitch to the other. As long as that top stitch is slanting the same way, you can start at the top and go to the bottom. You can go from the bottom up to the top. It doesn't matter. I would also say it doesn't matter again whether you're slanting like this or whether you're slanting like this. So um, I hope that helps. Um, in a similar um, topic, Jan said, do you prefer or does it make a difference if you stitch into or away from the row or, or area that came before? Does that question make sense? It absolutely makes sense. Um, and you hear this more in needlepoint circles than you do in counter cross stitch circles. But the general rule of thumb is if you can, start your stitch in what we call an empty hole and stitch into a filled hole. Now, if there aren't stitches around, it doesn't matter. But when, when you can, you do get um, prettier stitches by starting your stitch in an unoccupied hole and going into an occupied hole. It's not always possible. Sometimes you don't have any choice, but to place a stitch where you're starting in an occupied hole and going into an occupied hole. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. That's, that's one of the things I think that will, um, can help improve the way your stitching looks. That's it for the questions that I got um, this week, but I, I have a, a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart that was inspired by a, a post that somebody uh, made in, in one of the many groups. Sometimes I think I belong to too many groups about embroidery, but I'm kind of thinking that there is no such thing as too many groups. But anyway, um, somebody made a comment about losing needlework, um, whether it's on a subway or a bus or an airplane, um, stopping in a coffee shop to stitch and you get home and realize you didn't don't have it and you go back and it's not there. Or maybe you're traveling and you can't go back. Um, I have two things I wanna say about that. One of them is um, try to avoid putting your needlework 
in a Ziploc bag that's designed for food or other things. Not that there's anything wrong with them. We use them a lot in my household, but not for needlework. And that advice I'm gonna give you based on an experience that, that somebody, a good friend of mine had, where they were at a beach weekend, um, multi-generations of families coming in and out of the beach house, and they left their work um, on the kitchen table in a Ziploc bag. You know, next thing you know, somebody else came in and put something on top of it. Somebody else came in and put something on top of that. Next thing you know, there's clutter on the table. And a person came along and said, huh, I think I'll clean the kitchen up and started tossing things. And to them, they just saw the Ziploc bag with, with junk in it and it got, it got tossed. Now, my feeling is that if that project had been in a project bag, doesn't even have to be fancy, but if it had been in a, not in a Ziploc bag, I really wonder whether or not it would have been thrown out. So that's one thing I wanna say about not losing your work. The next thing is put some sort of identification in there, in, in, in the bag. Um, anything you take out of your house, put something in it that if a good, honest, well-meaning person finds it, they can get in touch with you. I, I don't know how often it happens that, that people lose a piece of needlework. I know it happened to me once. I'd left some knitting on, on an airplane, but I had no identification in my, in my knitting bag at all. There was no way that anybody could get in touch with me if they wanted to. And so from that personal experience, I started always making sure that um, my needlework projects, first of all, were in something that was identifiable as this is not junk <laughs> and that had um, some kind of information in there that would allow a person to get in touch with me. So um, that's all I wanted to say about that. And that kind of leads me um, to the end of my list. And I'm, once again, I'm done. And I am, again, so glad that you have, that, that you're watching this today. I um, am so grateful to the number of people that are spreading the word ab about um, my floss tube videos. And I am um, hoping that you'll subscribe and that I will see you next week. And um, as soon as I say goodbye, you'll see on the screen the um, names of the shops that are that you can find my, my work at. So give them a call or send them an email and um, let's get ourselves connected. So stitch happy and be safe.